get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Oh, that's my, I've just not done this in so long. I forgot that it's my turn to talk. So uh, here I am, everybody. It's nice to see you. Um, gosh, I'm so glad to be back here in the studio for the first time with Harry. He's not been here all summer long. Uh, we've worked out our conflicts and contract disagreements. So we'll more on that. And then also here is our good buddy, Ryan Holt. We're talking about impeachment. So I had to bring on Mr. Contrarian Trump hating Dennis. Uh, so we'll, uh, sorry, Ryan Holt. Dead naked right at the beginning. So we're going to be talking about Donald Trump, and we're going to figure out, is Donald Trump screwed? Stay tuned. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I don't even remember what episode this is because we've been uh, we've been interspersed some of the Dallas content, so I've lost track. I'm going to be talking about impeachment, like I said. Uh, very good to be back here in the studio. Man, it's been a long time since our first host here, uh, Harry. Let me just turn this off so we can hear his beautiful voice. Uh, Harry, how are you? Going good, going good. Um, fresh off uh, signing my 2020 contract. Yes, it's so nice to have you locked down for the next 14 years. I was say, I had a question about that. Yes, sir. So as, a, as the reporter in the room, is this the phase one of the agreement, like between China and, and, and the United States, or is there going to be a phase two? Do we just hash out and move the, the really important stuff to a second part, or is it all done? <sighs> It's just going to move into a phase two. Right. No, no, no. We've it's got, done. We got, past, <laughs> no. we got past the biggest sticking point. It is a comfortable 72 degrees here. It is. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, yes, everyone. Yes. has nothing to we do can... with Harry. It has everything yeah. to do with me losing weight. <laughs> I'm cold all the fucking time now. That's the part of the problem. Isn't I'm it? down to like 258 I have from, you know, 330 when I started this podcast down to 258 and I am cold all the time now. Yeah, I've been lobbying uh, Chris Fit uh, to, you know, get everything in motion and now it's nice, comfortable 72. Yeah, it's great. It's beautiful. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm just it's the first day we had the, it went from like 92 to 36 in a day. And I was like, why? I'm cold. I turned into one of those bitchy little men like Harry. I'm cold. I had to actually leave the house that day and take my wife to the doctor. Oh. And she was like, what is going on out here? Because <laughs> it started snowing. And I'm like, oh, it was brutal. This is Indiana. I think it was Halloween, wasn't it? Yes, yes. it was yeah, Halloween. Yeah. So it goes from, hey, it's a nice summer warm day to middle of winter. Get your coat. There's yeah. no fall. There's no spring. Mm-hmm. Harry hasn't been here in so long that he didn't even recognize the bookshelf change that has transpired in the in the room. Yeah, apparently Smegel has redecorated the studio, got a different bookshelf. Uh, the table, unfortunately, is still here. This uh, all looks the same over here, so I don't notice much. I don't I'm, really look behind me very often. I'm thinking about taking down the studio and returning, you know, just kind of let's let's do the kitchen table thing. You're going to be a normie. Kind of go back to the old days. We don't really do video. It's not really needed. And the, the only people that watch it are the patrons. We, we, you know, we wanted to try and build the YouTube, and that's just not happened. So it's like, forget it. Let's just let me have my kitchen table back, Harry. Who, who did we peg to oh. do the YouTube Well, we've pegged a lot of people over the and, years. And make but... it just great and be Joe Rogany. The person that owes us, specifically me, a public apology is Paul Copeland, is oh, I think no. who you're looking for. Escalaja, please. Yes. So, uh, a public apology, I'm sure, will be forthcoming. All right. I also owe you a public apology. You do? Yeah. For uh, what? So, I ran a low key wall episode last week for all the awesome people that was on the Twitch channel watched the low key wall yeah. episode. I realized that Twitch gave me the ability to run ads and make money off the ads I run on the. Uh, 
Would you make like fourteen dollars on that? I, I already ran one because I, once I realized it would allow me the ability to I could hit the run ad button all I wanted. How many ads did you run? I just ran one. Just ran one. It's low key walls your show. Just I'm more mad that you didn't send me the audio so I could use it for something. Okay, all right. I'll download the audio. Okay, thank you. Please, it's, send it, it saves it for like thirty days, doesn't it? Um, yeah, 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 for our channel, yeah, we get thirty days. If I would have linked my Prime account to it, it'll, it'll last longer. But I link my because. I didn't link my Prime account to it because I have my pri- I have a, already my have a Prime own Twitch, Twitch. Account. I have my own Twitch account. <laughs> yeah, I actually I think I closed down the other We Are Libertarians Twitch account. I I kind of I closed down a few different things last month and just trying to simplify, make it uh, less confusing for people. And as we go into 2020, we're going to get a lot of new people, and so um, I've been thinking a lot. in in the bonus episode for patrons. Uh, we talk a lot about kind of where my head's at and did I, have I made any impact for libertarianism? The answer in my local community is probably not uh, based on experience. So I'll, I'll elaborate on that if you'd like to hear it. Um, but uh, just trying to kind of, you know, just less. I'm trying to just have less. Like this is not my whole identity. This is just a part of my identity now. So we don't need to be so extra and have a studio in our living room. And as long as we don't go back to the couch. I like sitting on the couch, though. You can't tear up that contract. He, he doesn't want to sit on the there. couch, but he wants you to get into a hot tub and do a show yeah. with live mics. Yeah, fecal freaking soup. Let me get into a hot tub. That's what the, that's what the heat's for. That's disgusting. That's what the, all the chemicals keeps the water clean. No, we, we, we'd stick in these chairs. You'd still keep your chair. We'd still sit here. Um, you know, I got to keep my chair, right? Yep. So you have the hard chair. Well, I have a storage unit full of chairs. So it's just kind of like, you know. Why would you want to get rid of that chair? <laughs> I'm now at a point in my life where I wasn't ever using my kitchen table. Now, you know, I was using it for a lot of podcasts. And now I only use it for a podcast two, three times a month. But I use it every other day for dinner. And I'm just like... My life, I need to change my priorities a little bit. So oh, that's fine. That's fine. But, uh, All right. I'm fine with you tearing down the studio on okay. one condition. Okay. Can we get Reinhold a different cushion for the for his chair? I think it's flat. That is flat. That, that is, is flat, flat because, because I'm his, sitting on it's, it. It's and fat I wait ass. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. That is Cheeto a, shame. That's my, that's my. That is a puffy cushion that he flattened himself. <laughs> I. Except he, you are a puffy cushion. That's what, what I am. Yes. <laughs> I am in no delusions about that. Yeah. Um, Beautiful and brave. Right. Hold this. Uh, this is years of stress eating and issues and everything else all kind of packed in vaccines. One yeah. I found out like I can I stress work out. Like if I'm really oh, stressed for somebody. Oh, me. Oh, I'm just so good. I stress <laughs> work out. Oh, I just stress donate to charity. Oh. He does. Yeah, I did. I did that. I was very stressed out. Then I donated to charity. Felt great afterwards. When he, when he when he has an argument with niece, he does kegels all day. <laughs> it, uh, one uh, it helps strengthen my root chakra. Thirty thirty five okay. can still hit the ceiling. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can't you? <laughs> Anyways, but it strengthens my root chakra so I can do a lot of balance poses easier in yoga. Nerd. <laughs> um, I've, so I've been kind of, uh, I've been really, uh, the, what, yeah, the yeah. hot room yoga? Yes. Yeah, I've been doing hot. Yeah, I've been listening to too much, too much, too much Brogan. I was like, I got to do hot yoga. <laughs> I bet it's good. I need it. I need to be a little more flexible. Um, so I, I'm, I do a podcast called the Pat down with Miss Pat. It's one of the funniest podcasts you'll ever listen to. It's just, I cry when we do, we did three episodes today. It was so funny. Um, yes, sir. Did you hear the uh, Rogers review of the podcast that you'll laugh so hard you'll hurt? No. Yeah. He was talking to Kevin Smith about it. It was like, these are the funniest people he was talking to. Uh, it was, uh, uh, who was it? Uh, Tony Witherspoon just d- uh, passed away, uh-huh. and he went right into the other person who made him laugh so hard it hurt was Pat, Miss Pat in the Pat podcast. You're shitting me. Yeah, it's on the Kevin Smith episode, so check it out. Joe Rogan listens to a podcast I'm on. Apparently, well, that's spectacular. <laughs> spectacular. If you've never seen the kid stays in the picture by about Robert Evans, you have to. It's you'll you'll be going spectacular he just passed Robert, away yeah the robert evans stuff he's he's stuff. just it is great um 
Well, that's spectacular. Uh, so that's pretty cool, but it is. It's really funny. And so Miss Pat asked me to do stand-up, and Christy Avery was there, and so, of course, it got live-streamed. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll share that. In it's the, out there. Yeah. yeah we'll, I'll it put it in the show notes. If you want to watch me do stand up for the very first time, I wrote it that day until Facebook takes it down because of some content inside. Of, of course. Uh, so it was surprising. Like, here's the thing. I grew up like, I didn't care about sports. I memorized Bill Cosby and George Carlin albums and Bob and Tom songs and like John Fox records at five, which is why I'm as messed up as I am. And so, like, I always wanted to do stand-up comedy. It was just super intimidating to me. And I got up there, and it was like doing a podcast. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I felt that I did okay. Mm -hmm. I I know that I could do better. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't – it was – Miss Pat said I did really well. And if I wasn't funny, she would have told me no. And she's asked me to open for her a few more times. She's like, you need to do stand-up comedy, which is like – when she says something, I'm terrified of her, so I'll do it. Um, but you were telling me off air you're mad that I didn't bomb? Yes. Why? Because I figured if you'd bomb, you'd continue to want to keep doing it. Like, it would have been a challenge to you. I'm the opposite. Hmm. Because I'm super self-conscious about it mm-hmm. and was way overthinking it for years, Okay. getting up there and not falling flat on my face hmm. means, oh, I can do this. Well, you've been skirting with this for years because I remember two or three years ago you had uh, you interviewed some actual Comedian. stand-up comedians yeah. and you're like, I don't know, it's different than doing a podcast. I just I don't think I could do it. And then you've done some live shows yeah. at um, the former I, comedy club. That we no did exists. a live podcast at the Montreal Comedy Festival. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be at the San Francisco Comedy Festival in January. So and, it's like you skirted with it for a long yeah. time, but I don't think you were ready to make the kind of push. Somebody had to push it. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like somebody did. Yeah, yeah. So, well, she's so. <laughs> she's pushy. Uh, but That's perfect for, perfect person for that. So it was it was interesting. So go check that out. But yeah, it like it's um like you. Here's what I would tell. Here's the point for you, dear listener. If you are scared of something, just try it. This is something that I've been scared of doing for a very long time. Like I've been intimidated by it. And I'm still intimidated by the idea of, like, writing material. Like, I'm, I know I'm funny in conversation. Like, I've done enough podcasts. I've done th- thousands of hours of this by now that I know that, like, I can sit down here and I've prepped enough and we're going to have a good show and it's going to be of a certain quality. Um, I can go do an interview and I know I'm going to be fine. I can give a speech. I know I'll be fine. But, like, for whatever reason, even though it's sort of the same thing as – a podcast or whatever it was too intimidating to me and then i just did it like i let myself be forced into it and it wasn't i kind of liked it now if i had fallen flat on my face i would have been like i was right i would have confirmed all those insecure thoughts but yeah if there's something on there that you're thinking about trying like that just you know well, it, what a therapist told me once a long time ago was sit and think about what's the worst thing that could happen yeah because you, you, you start going, oh, I can't do this because – and you get an anxiety buildup, and you just, you're, you're freaking out about it. But you never sit down and logically go, okay, what's the worst that could happen? And then if that happens, well, big, it's not a big deal. Yeah. You know, if it's like – you know, it was like a social phobia thing. I used to have yeah. problems talking to people. I know that God, sounds I weird. I wish we could go back to those golden days, <laughs> Harry. Turn back to – Harry, could you imagine what that would be yeah, like? Yeah, that little right. quiet, but, right? And hold sitting in the corner, like, not uh, saying nothing. Like, I used to, I, <laughs> people used to think I was an, uh, an asshole because, wow, wow. because okay. I was, I was, I was real on. quiet and wouldn't talk to anybody. And now once I started talking and then they realized I'm, I'm an asshole, asshole because yeah. I'm an asshole. Yeah, right. I just uh, got Tom Woods and Joshua Smith on the phone and they said, what a fucking asshole. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. Uh, yeah. the qu- the quiet how you know, many, how, many, home. how many times a week do you get told you're not a real libertarian how many times a day how many times a day is what happened i had today i had it happen three or four times from people <laughs> from people in in the we are libertarian <laughs> podcast fans <laughs> chat are telling me i'm not a real libertarian and i'm like do you listen to the podcast no the answer's no yeah most of them it's don't okay. it's okay they're just in there i get called not a real anarchist <laughs> once in a while well, one of, one of them was in a conversation 
Not as much. That Ryan Lindsay had started. No. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> Ryan, I There's love a lot Ryan, of rub but, off there. Yeah. But, you know, you yeah. you got birds of a feather. Ryan no, started was, posting about how he loves AOC, and everyone's like, <laughs> I, apparently, just because I I think we should hold political people account, you know, elected officials accountable for their actions. I'm not a real libertarian. I don't I don't understand the whole thought process. You want to hold the wrong people accountable, right? Okay? Yeah. You got to exactly. forgive all those people. They're going after the. The other people that I don't like. Yeah. All right, save it, Mr. Yeah. Leftist. I'm still Republican in my heart, so we can't touch them yet. Yeah, that's all it is. It's like that's really what it is. Yeah, yeah. They, they're holding on to that GOP membership. One day they'll go Libertarian. Yeah, one day I'll be back. <laughs> we should infiltrate <laughs> and take over the Republican okay. Party, and we've only been trying for 20 years. Right? No, 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 40, 40 yeah. years. It's a lot better perks be part part of the Republican Party, though. The perks are better. All from the 1983 split. Better which... dinners. Oh. Well, anyway, it, you know, Harry, was it like a dinner? Time. Was it the split of dinner? Was it a dinner? Like, you know what? <laughs> Screw this, bro. Oh, no, it was ugly. Uh, it was a whole so ugly. I just thought of uh -oh. something. Uh, you two keep making fun of our listeners. Go ahead. Oh, we can do that. No problem. I, no, no, the 83 split happened. Oh, it was. I, I have a. I heard a story. I don't, I don't right, want to. Thanks for padding for me, Dennis. Sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to repeat right the story just, because I want the person who told the story to get, come on and, and tell oh, the story. Okay. So I need okay. to interview him. But all right, well, it's so good. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping. We want to say thank you to uh, Austin. So we have an Amazon wish list up at the website, mm -hmm. and Austin. Uh, sent us. He, he writes, I'm new to Wall and I'm very interested in learning more about libertarianism. Thank you, Harry. Oh, and dear leader too. <laughs> ha ha, from Austin. Well, Austin, go F yourself. Thanks, Austin. Um, you owe me a public apology, but we thank you for sending a microphone. You sent a USB mic, and I promptly put that back in the box and shipped it off to Brian Nichols, who desperately needed a new microphone. So if uh, you've not liked his quality, I've given you one of those. Yeah. So uh, we're going to give we, – we like to supply the host with equipment, and if you join the network, then we'd like to give you equipment. So Brian, going to sound, uh, sound lovely. Brian sent me such a cool gift. It's up there. You can see it. And uh, it's waveform of my favorite song, Simple Song. Um, well, this is just a simple song to say what you done by the shins. And uh, put my favorite lyrics on that. So thank you for that. We we got you. We got you doing stand up. Let's not push it too far. <laughs> I, I apparently cannot sing. Is Let's that walk before saying? we crawl. Okay. <laughs> uh, and you have not seen this present from Jason Doolittle to you, although it's too late now. This is a blanket that has been co opted by uh, other people who visit the, uh, the the studio here every once in a while. But this is really soft. Isn't that really nice? It's a blanket from Jason Doolittle to keep you warm during the show. But the problem is it's 72 in here now. You can't really wear that. You'll start sweating. Yeah. That's true. True. That's what I got the hot yoga for, see? It'll help out. And we want to thank you our patrons. Ice cream at that point. Oh, yeah. Just I just cream. threw the ice cream out yesterday and tried to, <laughs> trying to buckle down and get, lose more weight. No halo top? Nope. That's trash. That That is the shittiest fad. But it's only like... 280 calories so though. what i don't it's frozen water if there's not a thousand calories in it that's not worth eating <laughs> i'm not gonna eat frost i'll go lick my windshield before i eat halo top i, I halo top is nice ice cream it is crap it is garbage you is apologize <laughs> to the listeners for even recommending such garbage i recommend it you're gonna you're gonna suggest a cauliflower pizza too right, right. Call, yeah why don't you go ahead and do that mr fit man <laughs> do like a nice cauliflower pizza yeah of course you would yeah you do get your cauliflower pizza, your halo top, and then if you just drink dry champagne too, that's a nice, that's a nice night with your boyfriend. <laughs> I apologize, I know that was offensive, but thank you. I don't care. care. You would grow up. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, uh, oh, <laughs> halo top. Like you it. have the worst ideas. You are the smartest person I know with the dumbest ideas. Quit wrong with my ideas. My ideas are great. They Your idea work. was to take this rented luxury apartment with a beautiful open concept and drywall myself uh, a studio. Uh, first off. Uh, and then just tear it down before you move out so you get your security deposit back is what he said. Big thing there. See? <laughs> and it wouldn't take that long either. A couple two by fours. As a matter of fact, it doesn't have to be a real wall. One by twos and drywall. Oh, Harry. Some mud, some sheet. Ted Wisner would have got this place looking nice. He would have. Mm -hmm. But uh, fortunately, Ted passed away this past weekend. And uh, it's very similar to Michael Hastings. We think the deep state has something to do with it. 
Uh, that's a joke. He's perfectly alive and well. Um, he's just unemployed and has no phone, so we have no idea what he's doing. I don't know about perfectly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you to our patrons, especially our $100 a month uh, contributors, Ed Brehob, love intern Ed, such a good man, Matthew Durbin, who's new to the stable. We thank him. Jeff Bennett. Um, you know, we're really thankful to have him. Jason Doolittle. I got to see Jason in Dallas. It was so good to get to spend some time with him. He took me out to dinner and bought me some great barbecue. Uh, Craig DaCosta. And, of course, the lovely Christy Avery, who has the hot tub I will never get in. Um, she, she was watching the show live every week. Is there a live show? Yes. All right, cool. I'm going to watch my hot tub. Tonight, she turned us off for the Little Mermaid Live. Can you believe that? Well, wait, is this Little Mermaid live on ice? It, I'm sure it's on ABC and they're promoting oh, Disney it's Plus. ABC yeah, mm. so we'll we'll see what that is. I thought she went to like the ice capades or something. Yeah, you Little don't have Mermaid. to hold that blanket if you don't want to. I could. All right, okay. <laughs> this is Whoopi. It's soft <laughs> and warm. It really is a great blanket. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's jump into tonight's topic. Let's talk about is Donald Trump screwed? Uh, so we've got great show notes. Thanks to the Sam Schultz. Quick answer, yes. Let's move on to the yes. next. <laughs> so you can <laughs> topic, something else. <laughs> see those great uh, show notes on the uh, well, the show notes section, the description of this episode, or at wearelibertarians.com. Uh, when we do an episode, which is kind of what what I have termed an explainer episode, like this, we always have great show notes to kind of help guide us through. Um, and tonight is no exception and i'm sure dennis will have or excuse me reinhold a lot to say i might have a few things to say. yeah uh, trump hating reinhold over here <laughs> mr leftist not a real libertarian hating trump <laughs> yeah exactly well here's here's my thing with trump okay <sighs> donald trump is at war with our government and i know as a libertarian it seems like such a seductive thing to want to support a man who is at war with the security state, the war, the, the foreign policy establishment, Congress, Democrats, big spending progressives. Like it's very uh, alluring. Like the idea that we'd have a president who's at war with our own government, like libertarians should be into that idea. The problem is that Donald Trump is not at war for the sake of reducing the size and scope of government. He's at war with our own government to assuage his own ego. And so that is, is just fruit of the poisonous tree for me. And I just think that when libertarians quasi step into liberta supporting Donald Trump, I, I think you're, you're, uh, you're just misguided, well, it, if I can be so bold. It's more of a, they have a, like waiting for so long for someone to come along and shake everything up. Yeah. So they've jumped on this idealist view but the realism of what is happening and what's going on and what Trump thinks and what he's trying to implement is far different from that. And it's almost yeah. 180 degrees different. Like It's like he said something about the problem is the, the, the national uh, banks or the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve, we should be, you know, is, is a horrible problem. And everybody, all the libertarians are, are immediately jumping on going, yeah, yeah, go get right. that. And he, the problem was that he was wanting more control over it. So he could m more manipulate the money supply mm -hmm. through the federal bank at his own whim. Right. The exact opposite of what we should be looking. You know, it, it, it's that sort of thing that gets exasperating to me with people supporting him like that. I think you have to look at it at this point and go, what, it, what policy is Donald Trump really pushing? What reductions in size and scope of government is he really pushing? What... What is Donald Trump actually doing at pre as president at this point, except fighting for his own political survival? Well, I mean, the there's just not much there anymore. And I think if you're, if you're like, I'm, I've always tried to give Trump the benefit of the doubt. I've said a million times on this show, a former co-host, Greg, used to wisely say, he had many wise things to say, but he'd say, it's, it's, if you go after someone like Donald Trump too hard, it's a net negative for the growth of liberty. Because when somebody, when libertarians make fun of AOC or Donald Trump too hard, what they do is the people like you were saying, you know, they have their little Republican card inside and mm -hmm. they're like, one day you'll be, I'll keep you, I'll pull you back out because mm -hmm. you'll be libertarian. But until then, I'll be a libertarian party person. They, they look at that and they kind of are sympathetic to Donald Trump. And so when you criticize Donald Trump or AOC, they hear criticisms of themselves. They don't hear criticisms of the individual. 
And so it's a net negative for the growth of your movement, your party, your podcast, your whatever, right? And so I've tried to be fair to Donald Trump and approach what we do at the show with an open mind and say, I'm sure there are a lot of people that listen to the show that are somewhat sympathetic to Donald Trump, or they're more like Dennis, who are just, sorry, Reinhold, uh, at this point, this is just, I'm, this is how it is. I'm just too <laughs> retarded to do this show. Um, I'll cut that out. Uh, okay, I'm just too stupid to do this show. Um, so I just don't, I don't know at this point what Donald Trump is doing at pre as president that deserves him a second term. Because at this point, I can tell you, and you guys vouch for me, Mike Pence was the worst modern governor Indiana has had. We have had, and he followed Mitch Daniels, which is a hard act to follow. But Mike Pence was pretty terrible as governor. And I think he'd be a better president at this point than Donald Trump. Uh, so 100%. it's, you know, Donald Trump is, uh, so I've tried to always give him the benefit of the doubt right. because I think the media is so, everything that I, as I tried to prep for the show, everything you see is just, it's just knee-jerk anti-Trump. And I know that the media is just corrupt and awful, but at a certain point, you have to look at it and go, Donald Trump is corrupt and awful too, and you don't have to choose a side. You can literally think both of them are corrupt and awful. Mm -hmm. And so... This is not a, a slamming Donald Trump episode. Uh, we're just trying to look at it. Well, I can't speak for Dennis. I just think overall, you have, to, you have to start looking at the presidency of Donald Trump and go, what are you really getting out of this? Right. Because the one thing you have to understand is you have to look at what is being done, not what he says. Because right. what he says changes from day to day mm -hmm. to the point he contradicts himself. So yeah. Anybody who's... Like Liberty Mind, you can go and find five to ten quotes from Donald Trump and says, look, this is what he says. This is what he's trying to implement. Yeah. But then you could go uh, two weeks later and find the exact opposite thing that he says. And, right. and yeah. if you look at what he's implementing, what he's implementing is Keynesian economics, continuation of what Obama did. Yeah. All the stuff that he complained about Obama doing, he's doing with a little bit of anti-immigration thrown in. Yeah. That's really it. Yeah. That little bit of, bit of spin on it there he, that he does. The, uh, because he's so chaotic and ineffective, the, the establishment that he hired to fill all those slots. Because here's what you have to understand about Washington is as Obama's administration leaves, all those people who work in the government go work at think tanks mm -hmm. until they have another administration. Democrat. And then the Democrats, they then yeah. they go in. And then so all the AEI guys and Heritage Foundation guys and Federalist Judicial Society guys, Watch. Judicial Watch, they all moved into the Trump administration. Yeah. They all worked for Bush. They're all like Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh worked for, for Bush. He worked for, uh, you know, the Kim Star, Star investigation. Yeah. You know, and so he, that's green. the swamp. So the swamp is really still controlling Donald Trump's administration. And you read these articles where the, Donald Trump says something and they, they just ignore him. They don't do what he Well, and part of the wants. problem, too, is that the swamp is actually – the swamp's a bad thing because, and it's given a bad name because a lot of people make money. I mean, you have, but you have people in Trump's administration doing the same or worse things than what the people in the swamp are doing. Right. And the people in the swamp were actually trying to keep everything on an even keel and not be too crazy. And now we're seeing that it got, it's gotten crazy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. what's going on in there. And from the testimony and stuff from the uh, impeachment inquiry, um, it's, it's, mind-blowing what's going on that i genuinely believe donald trump doesn't think he's doing anything wrong right in his mind he's completely right about everything and it's like no that's not. just so i i think that i think the the welcome mat for trump is wearing out where everybody's got a person in their life like this the person who they think that if they speak it into existence, that becomes the truth. They're so narcissistic mm -hmm. that they will bully you. They'll cajole you. They, they, gaslight they you. will gaslight you. They, you know, they're, mm -hmm. you know, you, if you're a woman, you dated that guy. If you're a guy, you may have had that person as a mom or a dad, like every, or they're your boss. Oh, like cool. everybody has had that person in their life where it's just like, I just am so exhausted by this person. Mm -hmm. I can't take it anymore. I think that's where it's getting to with Trump. Now, the Democrats are going to screw this up because he's 
neck and neck in some of these battleground states. Yeah. Well, I think with the, the – Let Harry – oh, yeah. so like, The one thing, Luke, the, the great thing about Trump is – and I think this is a I, – I see this as a benefit to the whole system at large – is that he's changed the game a little bit on we are going to – People are going to expect more out of the next president to actually to speak more to the people using yeah. using maybe not using Twitter, maybe just using a different, hopefully, you know, an, a federated code, you know, open source, you know, system to talk to people, maybe email. But according to the uh, Trump database, he sent over close to 1,800 tweets out since being elected. Yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Ridiculous amount, but the ridiculous amount of communication, but but uh, it completely like just trumps like what Obama because most people never really like you. Only time you ever heard Obama speak was well orchestrated speeches. Trump is giving get tons of press conferences, tons of and everything's been recorded, and it's it, it's 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 interesting. The stream of consciousness that's entering into the Twitter feed uh-huh. is a sign of a diseased mind. <laughs> A, a man not, child, not fair to with the low IQ to <laughs> diagnose exactly. anyone that you have never met. It, no, it's it's unprofessional as a uh, psychiatrist, which I am not, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to do that. So I do what I want. So <laughs> it, on those on those Twitter numbers, the New York Times analyzed it. Harry's showing his database <laughs> in the middle of the oh, Please yeah, sure. put your yeah. database back. Oh, here. this is you know, who. So we're getting, we're getting into the porn stuff. All right. Look at that. Quiet you. It's timestamp too. So the number of tweets that President Trump has sent, according to the New York Times, uh, literally half. How many tweets has he sent out? 1,800. 18,000? 1,800 since president. Uh, okay. So the uh, he's sent out 5,889 tweets where he's attacked someone or something. 2,026 tweets where he's praised himself, 1,700 tweets where he's promoted conspiracies, which who knows what the New York the conspiracy theory is a, a broad term that is used to, it's a, it's a censoring term. It's not a fair term in my opinion. Uh, 233 tweets where he attacked ally nations and 132 t- tweets where he praised dictators. So that, that's his Twitter record. Uh, you're going to need to turn your mic. This is why I took this away from you. You were not responsible enough to have this kind of mic switch. <laughs> My button you can't have the power. Right. Reinhold does a good job of turning it off so we don't hear his, his awake apnea. And then you won't turn it back on to hear your voice. Now, what were you going to say? I was going to say, sorry, 1800s. It's the, that's which Max my phone wants to give me right now in the database. It's like I have to go to the next page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally forgot. Sorry about that. That's okay. Hit you forgive me. Go to a different sheet. Uh, How many pages? Uh, we can we can extrapolate. If we have eighteen hundred a page. We know how many pages. We can pages we can apparently. calculate this. All right. Apparently, I don't know what's. I, I'm losing control of my own show. I don't even know what's going on. So let's get into. Apparently, things over at my database over at Gig. And it's just X. What are you even talking about? Jesus, how many? What are you? He's done? What are you talking about? I. It's what, a database. I've created. Of a, what? Trump tweets. There's just a database. He, he's scroll. He's personally scrolling Twitter for Trump's tweets and storing them in his own personal database on his system. And even Texas, it takes as soon as he tweets it. It's, he's, he's not. He's not relying it. on somebody else who's done this and he's pulling it from a website. He's doing this himself. So as soon as it goes through the Twitter, I grab it. Okay. So if he deletes it, I already grab. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I grab. So it. we got copies of anything he's deleted. Ooh, this could be valuable. There's the stuff that he's deleted. He's he's deleted yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Deleted he stuff. Had, yeah. We talked yeah. About there's some weird. Du- there's weird duplicates in there too. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. 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 We may be on the the verge of uncovering a conspiracy here. We are libertarians. Uh, We're gonna get a call from uh, <laughs> Chuck Schumer or Ed so, Schiff or somebody. So let's jump into the. Uh, let's talk about exactly what happened because on September 24th, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi opened a formal impeachment inquiry into President Donald J. Trump over allegations that Trump pressured a foreign power, Ukraine, to investigate a political rival, former Vice President Joe Biden and his son Hunter, for his own political gain. Allegedly. Uh, Allegedly, thank you. 
Uh, now, we here at We Are Libertarians, because we are intelligent and followers of the news, did an episode on the history of impeachment. Uh, so because I think we did that, what, a year ago? It felt like it, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. because we knew that impeachment would eventually come around, depending on what happened with the Mueller investigation. So we talked extensively about the three impeachments. We didn't get to Richard Nixon because that's a whole other can of worms. Uh, but even though he's the most analogous of the other three impeachments, um, there was Clinton, there was Andrew, J uh, not Andrew, J Andrew Johnson, and then there were articles of impeachment filed against Ulysses S. Grant for speeding with his horse and carriage in yeah. Washington, D.C. Andrew Jackson should have there, been impeached. There, yeah. were, there were files <laughs> of impeachments filed but not passed for Hoover yeah. after the election. And he lost. So he loses the election <laughs> to FDR and somebody puts in articles of impeachment twice mm. in that lame duck session. We went deep on the Clinton investigate, uh, the, the Clinton impeachment. And then that was a really good episode. Tad and I did, if I do say so myself. Well, but and and one out. thing too, I wanted to bring up too, is there's been three uh, presidential impeachment that you're talking about. Yeah. There's been 19 impeachments. Have there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you, the 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 impeachment clause in the constitution talks about the president and executive officers okay so there have been executive officers that have been impeached uh including back in the 1800s mm -hmm. there was somebody impeached for blasphemy <laughs> uh thomas pickering i think was his okay name, was a judge uh we had a we had someone impeached for blasphemy we had somebody impeached for being drunk in public yeah um not doing his job as a judge very well can being drunk actually as a judge, uh, that sort of thing. So the idea of uh, misdemeanor, too many people hear the, hear the phrase misdemeanor and think the legal statute misdemeanor, but that's not what misdemeanor means. High, high crimes and misdemeanors is in the, in the actual constitution. Right. And misdemeanor mm -hmm. is the, the, like it's not the crime because Donald Trump technically has committed no crimes uh, along the lines of Ukraine. Um, you can claim bribery all you want. No, no, I'm not talking about bribery. I'm talking about federal election FEC laws. Everybody brings up FEC. Look, give me a break. Let me tell you something. No disrespect to you, Reinhold. Mm -hmm. But if somebody brings up, it's an election violation. It's a violation of FEC laws. They're stupid and reaching. You're not stupid. No, no, no. I'm no, saying no. it is what a I'm saying stupid, is, stupid thing to say. I, I because, don't. No, hold on. Every single candidate ever has violated federal election laws. It's one of those overarching things that you can fit into any weird thing you want, and every candidate does it, and nobody's going to pursue it because at the end of the day, everybody knows they break the law, and they don't want them opening investigations to that stuff because then you'd have 535 impeachments over election laws like it's just one of those things where election laws are the most violated and ignored because politicians are all fundamentally corrupt themselves like if somebody goes well he technically broke election law they're reaching like i'm sorry like he he it's didn't not technically he broke it's what what extortion. donald trump what donald trump did is pretty much what every president on the planet has done no. he's they're just he's stupid enough to get no, caught. no 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 i disagree Okay. When you have the people who are testifying right now saying that I've been doing this job for 37 years and this is the first time I've seen anything like this happen. I mean, that's, that's in the testimony. The, the, but the problem with all this, and we'll... And, and it's by, we're that's, analyzing before we're giving right. details. My, my, my point being is that Donald Trump didn't technically break a law. I, I don't... I don't, I don't agree. You can figure out whatever law you want to charge him with later, but he didn't go out and shoot somebody in the face. Uh, so it's not that I don't that think clear. a lot of people would care. That's uh, the problem. The, right. <laughs> so, who we shot. so in, even if he didn't break a law, he can still be impeached. Right. Mm -hmm. That is true. Is my point. Yeah. You argumentative person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you can even break the law and not be impeached. Too. That's exactly yeah, yeah. right. You, yeah. you could jaywalk. Somebody. And a lot of people had a problem with Clinton being impeached because part of the pro part of the thing about the impeachment clause was they wanted it in there in case there was a, a violation of, of the trust of the office. Right. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that Clinton lying 
under oath in a personal matter, in a personal lawsuit, you know, that had nothing to do with him as president, shouldn't have been impeachable. Yeah, I mean, I'm much more, I have a higher bar on impeachment than you do. Yeah. I mean, I don't know where you come down on it, but I'm the type where it's like the voters voted. The voters are going to vote next year. Like, why are we even bringing up impeachment? When well, in re- I mean, now, now, once we go through this, you'll see, like, he's screwed. Yeah. But, you know. There, there's like, a reason now. <laughs> right. Um, but my, my threshold for impeachment is much higher because I, I look at it as you're overturning the will of the voters and you're turning the republic into uh, just a, an upsetting – uh, paralyzing thing and that's why democrats from day one literally the first day of office they started calling some started calling for impeachment al green's been trying to re- impeach him for racism like you couldn't find a more vague thing than that but like don't say it didn't happen with obama it didn't happen with bush when bush got into office it, they were going did, to but that's because the republicans overplayed their hand and pursued impeachment with bill clinton mm-hmm. for things that yeah, he probably should have been charged after he was out of office, but you're talking about a five-year investigation in Whitewater leading to the Monica Lewinsky perjury charge, getting him on a process crime. You completely you, – you, you look like you were persecuting a popular president for political reasons, and that's why most people now are not going to really buy a lot of this impeachment talk because the Democrats, the same Democrats that were being persecuted by Republicans back then – were the ones who really started pushing impeachment right away against Donald Trump with the Russiagate stuff, which turned out to be a nothing burger. Well, it's hilarious, too, because everybody complains about there wasn't a full vote before we had, and I know we're getting a little ahead, but there wasn't a full vote before um, they started doing the inquiries. Well, they used to have to do a full vote to give the, the committees the subpoena power that they right. were going to need. But in, tw- in 2000, oh, I can't remember what year it was, 2014, 2015, Republicans trying to get after Obama changed the rules yeah. to give the committees the power for subpoena right. without a full vote. And at the time, Democrats said, you're going to end up paying for this. This yep. is going to come back to bite you. And it did. And just a couple of years later, there we are. Yeah. They, they, they warned them, and the Republicans did it anyway. So Ukraine is at the center of a lot of this for several reasons. So natural gas plays a role in this because the the country of Ukraine is a fundamentally, like most former Russian satellite states, is a fundamentally corrupt place, and they need natural gas. They're in they're uh, in basically a standoff with Russia, mm-hmm. and uh, so they need to buy natural gas, and so uh, the. You know, the Trump administration and Rick Perry, the energy secretary in particular, have been trying to make a lot of inroads into the Ukraine to sell natural gas. And along the way with Donald Trump, that caused some friction with the ambassador that was there. I forget her name, um, but uh, she she was fired and then Yanovich. Yanovich and then she was replaced by Taylor. And uh, there's been what's been dubbed the three amigos and two of them have testified their testimony basically sunk one of the 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 transcripts that are getting leaked are from these three guys well rick perry who has has he resigned i think he's still active but he's resigning his post as energy secretary um one of the five that he was going to close down he's now the uh the uh, lead at the energy department and then um a former a major gop donor who wanted desperately to be an ambassador to something is a special envoy to the Ukraine. And his name, the S one, what's Sondland. Sondland. And then um, he paid a million dollars for that. He paid a million dollars to, to basically be the special envoy to Ukraine. Or the EU. The EU. Yes. He's yes. ambassador to EU. EU. Correct. But he has some Ukrainian title as well. Hmm. I read. And so, um, so these are kind of the players that are involved in some of this. Now, Rick Perry, who was on something called The Journal, which is a Gimlet and Wall Street Journal podcast, was basically like, I never heard anything about Biden, but Donald Trump had a weird thing with Ukraine. He, he just, it, it bugged, the Ukraine was always on his mind. He was preoccupied with it. And I couldn't figure it out. I was just trying to sell them natural American natural gas, and I couldn't get him to do anything on it. 
because he was just obsessed with the Ukraine. And Donald Trump in his brain is still obsessed with legitimizing his win in 2016. And to do that, he must show that the Democrats are corrupt too, that Hillary Clinton is corrupt too, that there's there if it's the whataboutism. Mm -hmm. If I may be this, but you're this too. Well, it's worse than that because the conspiracy theory that he's following, and I don't know you don't like the word conspiracy theory, the phrase conspiracy theory, but it, it actually fits uh, in this case, is that the – the Ukrainians are the ones who hacked the DNC server right. in agreement with the DNC in order to frame him into the Russia collusion thing, make it right. look like Russia did it and did it for his, for his benefit. And it's like, n no. <laughs> Which is why you hear him uh, talking about, you know, the, the servers, they never, the, basically the cloned disks and you may, maybe can speak, of, but uh, crowd, crowd strike. strike. CrowdStrike is basically the security firm that investigated and, the DNC hacks. And Harry and I talked about this a lot on Low Key Wall uh -huh. uh, a couple of years ago, a year ago, I think, a little bit over a year ago. And at that time, I was a little bit more investigating into this until I mm -hmm. found out. So there was some information from Mueller that came out during the investigation uh, that was released by the intelligence community that kind of turned me off on this whole thing. Uh -huh. Is that... Um, well, how we know, I mean, we get CrowdStrike, blah, 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 all this sort of stuff. Uh, they didn't get the real server. Well, first of all, there were 140 servers, yeah. right? It was right. a cloud mm -hmm. system. It wasn't like a server, and he yeah. thinks that the server's sitting in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But even worse than that is when, when they released the information of, well, here's the people who were hacking the DNC. Here's the computers they were on. Mm -hmm. Here's their names. Here's the times that they were doing it. And I realized that the only way they could know that was if the – intelligence community had already hacked the Russian workstations hmm. and were yeah. watching them do it. Interesting. Right. So I don't think they're wrong <laughs> in what's going on. I think we hacked them long before they hacked us. Right. Yep. Cause that's the only one you can figure out other than that they wouldn't know. So they had a hack and just go back to the database. Like, Oh yeah, we know exactly when that happened. Yeah. It was this person yeah. on this date logged into this machine name and this IP address and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yep. Okay. Yeah. The only way you, the only, there's only one way you can know that. Yeah. So, and, right. and I'm surprised yeah. it hasn't been picked up a lot more, but it's. Well, because if you pick that up, then that dredge ball, that stuff, up, and that just goes to show the only reason we know any of this, the, that capability is because it's Snowden. And then that opens that well. whole can of worms. And no one was like, <laughs> oh, crap, we're going to just talk about Snowden again. Yeah. yeah. And it all comes around. Yep. So he, you hear him talk about, hey, the clone server. Uh, they basically looked at the, the cloned image disks. I mean, basically, they could take a look at everything that was on the Democrat servers. But in, yeah, yeah. in his mind, somehow, the Ukrainians, these servers, the original servers, this is boomer tech knowledge. She's, the servers were in the Ukraine. So they took the physical computers to the Ukraine, and the Ukrainians are hiding this information. And if Rudy Giuliani and I can track down these servers and we can prove that the Clintons were in on all this stuff and William Barr and mm -hmm. right. Then we can, that's murkier. Rudy Giuliani's in the thick of it. So we'll, we'll focus on him more, but uh, the attorney general's role where there's smoke, there's fire, but it's much, much murkier than it is mm -hmm. with Rudy Giuliani. Who's like just in the middle of now, why is Rudy Giuliani in the middle of anything? Why is the former mayor of New York in the middle of anything? Well, what Rudy Giuliani did was he tra he took his role as the New York as New York's mayor, America's mayor, and turned himself into a security expert, and would go around the world and do security consulting both here mm -hmm. in the United States and around the world. And so he had extensive security contracts. So Rick Perry and everybody are over in the Ukraine tr trying to sell rights, and they're uh, so uh, he he. So at, at a certain point, Trump gets mad at this uh, female ambassador and fires her. The female ambassador has made an enemy of many different people in Ukraine because when she was ambassador, she was actually taking on corruption and she was fighting against corruption. And she was disliked by many people in the Ukraine that Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani specifically were friends with. And so much of what you see Rudy Giuliani and Donald Trump saying about the Ukraine as a counter to what maybe the New York Times is saying, 
is actually coming from the the opposition to this anti-corruption ambassador that America had in there at the time. That she gets replaced, she he gets fired, gets replaced by uh, Ambassador Taylor, who testifies. And and basically, when he got in there, he was like, "I've never seen anything like this in my thirty some years." Yeah. He this was is, he was begged to come out of retirement right. by the Trump administration to go do that job. Right. So they so a lot of the information that you see from Rudy Giuliani, for instance, is sort of like it's he said, she said from the two political factions within the Ukraine politics. So here in America, because we have none of the nuance, we're like, well, I see the president and Rudy Giuliani and, and Sean Hannity saying one thing. And I see the New York Times and the and the House Democrats saying another, and I don't know who to believe. So hopefully that kind of gives you a little bit of a background. And so what what Trump has been mainly focused on was the servers. He's he's really intent on getting the truth out of Ukraine. He really wants to vindicate his 2016 win. But somewhere along the line, he find out finds out that Hunter Biden's son. Uh, Joe Biden's son, Hunter, is on the board of directors for a Ukrainian energy company that is under investigation, and that Joe Biden had uh, some role in advocating for the main investigator in Ukraine being let go. Now, this investigator, sort of like their attorney general, for lack of an uh, artful term, was not tough enough on crime in the opinion of the Obama administration, and so he was advocating that this investigator who was investigating his son's company be let go. And he was using the power of the vice presidency. Do I have that wrong? Okay, let's hear why, why you believe I have the facts wrong. Well, so first of all, the, the reason why he, the uh, Sor Sonkin, I think was his name, Sonkin, was um, – as they wanted him gone was because the UK was trying to investigate a former energy executive, uh, an oligarch, basically, that had been ousted in the Ukraine. Okay. They still owned uh, several companies. Okay. One of those companies was Burisma. Okay. Okay. So the UK is trying to investigate him. He's froze his assets. Uh, but they got stonewalled because the, the prosecutor – in the Ukraine was protecting him mm -hmm. because he was corrupt. So he was blocking all investigations into the company Burisma. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then Joe Biden, uh, under the direction of Obama, because the UK, the EU, the IMF, Democratic congressional members and Republican congressional members all were yelling about this corrupt um, prosecutor and wanted him gone there's republican senators that wrote a letter that you can read online right now that's still on their website where they're saying we want this guy gone mm -hmm. uh everybody in the western hemisphere wanted him gone because he was blocking all investigations into these people because he was corrupt right so biden in in a uh, famous um video trying to make himself the hero of his own story as he always seems to do tried to make it sound like he muscled the guy out on his own right which didn't really happen but he right. did threaten to say okay we won't we won't uh support you getting this aid coming up if you don't get rid of him and and he was gone well when that person gets fired that opens up the next person to come in and then possibly and in, actually investigate Burisma because right. all the documentation that Ukraine had from the prosecutor's office was that nothing was happening during that investigation. Mm -hmm. And they weren't just investigating Burisma. It was all of the companies that this oligarch owned. Now the oligarch did go out and hire a, a few people. One of them was Hunter Biden in order to give his company an appearance of legitimacy. Sure. Now, I'm sure it's, the fact that his dad was pure, vice president was... No, no. Yeah, and, and he was probably thinking, oh, I can get something out of this. Yeah, of course. But Biden ended up actually firing the one person who was blocking the investigation into that company and actually putting it more in danger mm. of being investigated. That's where the timeline doesn't work with the whole theory that he fired him for investigating Burisma. Correct, yeah. And it, yeah, that's what you... And they actually... 
uh, that new prosecutor went after them. Yeah, more well, strong. The, the new prosecutor ended up being as, if not worse, more yeah. corrupt than the old one, and they just finally got rid of him. And and there's some details that just came out about um, Parnas, the the one of the Giuliani's associates that ties all of this together, and it yeah. starts to make a little more sense. Um, but yeah, that that person who replaced uh, the former the former prosecutor wasn't so good either. So they just had an election. Mm -hmm. They got a new president. It, mm -hmm. it when? Yeah. Late last year? Yeah, Zelensky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he just took office. That's who this whole meeting was with. And they're talking about putting in a, another prosecutor. And this prosecutor needs to be good on corruption. And that's kind of where the mindset is on making sure that they're going to follow through on corruption issues. But then they kind of – Trump kind of ties this conspiracy theory between the – um, the servers, DNC servers, and hacking CrowdStrike, and uh, the Joe Biden thing because he thinks he can get Biden. Yeah, right. so he, and, he'd be, he'd be safe. A, he'd be safe if he said, "Hey, the Justice Department has an active investigation into the 2016 and, and Hillary Clinton and servers yeah. and all that." He'd be safe there. But the problem was he was going after. If you're prosecuting past elections, okay, but when you start prosecuting potential future opponents. Well, that sort of gets a little sticky. Well, and the, and the worst part is, is that it, because people are saying, well, that call was perfect, right? There was no, he said there's no, there's, there's no literally no other person on the person. planet right. calling that perfect. No, I, perfect. I, I am serious, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> I've got people who are libertarians telling me, oh, no, this was, there was no quid pro quo in there. There's nothing wrong with that. You need to read that transcript because you obviously it. hasn't read, you haven't read the call. You, there's nothing wrong in, with what he did there. I'm like, you, you're not, you're, you're crazy. <laughs> Yeah. But, but that's not the whole thing. It, it turns out that, okay, so let's say he did that. Well, it could have been an offhanded thing, or he could have been in his mind thinking that he was doing something to prove that they, you know, there, there's things you could do to a state his mind right there to try and give some defense. But then when you start looking at the fact that, you know, three months earlier, this started, mm -hmm. uh, we have stuff that happened back in November of last year. This has all been kind of going a long way. And one of the conditions that he was trying to put in place in order to release the aid was that Zelensky would go onto CNN, not Fox, mm -hmm. CNN, and announce that they were doing an investigation into Biden without any acknowledgement that they were the ones who wrote the announcement for him to speak. Essentially putting into the bloodstream of yeah. the American mm -hmm. press, hey, Joe Biden, this to, to, to damage yeah. the one person that really could actually beat Trump. Right. Because let's be honest, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren don't have it. Joe Biden probably doesn't either, but he's the most moderate of this nutty crowd. So, so what you, you were? Andrew Yang. <laughs> Andrew Yang. Well, I don't think you, he's really moderate. But you were Ludicac, you were going to say maybe. something, Harry? Yeah. We we cut you off several times. Yeah. As we did. <laughs> I'm better. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, because like I learned a lot of this stuff about the other. I, I unfortunately like watched uh, Chris Hayes. <laughs> what? Before. Yeah, I know. Uh, you just cut your balls off. As first off, self-flagellation. Chris Hayes. He's got a great haircut. Beautiful so, hair. Beautiful hair. I like his glasses. He's mm -hmm. got a good look. Yeah, great look. Okay. Uh, but yeah, he was the only person I could find to really talk about the other side about the whole Ukraine because there's up, there's more stuff going on because right. of the simple fact that because everyone's like, well, the Ukrainian president said that you know there was no quick pro quo and never felt pressures. Like he just won an election. Mm -hmm. He can't be seen weak to the United States government, beholden. Like because that's all the that's all the next election. Like he he'll bend the knee to the Americans. Look, yeah. he just bends the knee. Well, he's and the worst. And we I'll, don't need him. I'll let you get back to. Uh, I'm going to let you speak in a minute. But <laughs> That's a great first, point, but I'm going to let you finish. I'll let you finish. My man, but Kanye. Speaking to that specifically, there uh, is a report now that two months before, when they were doing this pre-stuff, mm -hmm. that Zelensky had to have a meeting with his cabinet that was supposed to be about something else, and yeah. it turned into a three-hour, how do we deal with this <laughs> pressure we're getting from the right. White House, and how do we navigate it? And there's like three different people have reported who were in the meeting have reported this happened. Mm -hmm. So he was in private feeling pressure, but he's not going to say that in public right? because, you know, the United States president has a little bit of power. Yeah, just a yeah. little. Just a little. The, the, the level of – they're not equals. Let's put it that way. No, they're totally equals, <laughs> but different. You know, everyone's equal, just different. Uh, the, but, like – Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. No, yeah. I, cut, I thought but, you were done. Sorry, you. Yeah. Because you could put the tinfoil hat on and go, like, this is – would be the – you know, if – 
could be 5D chess that, you know, you know, the CIA is trying to <laughs> get their person elected in the Ukraine in a few years. That's like I said, that's a conspiracy theory. That's, you know, tinfoil hat, 5D chess, right. CIA move of like. They would we, never do such a thing. No, never. Not this open. They, no. They disable, you know, disabled country and got to get their person elected, but just not try to use, try to get Trump involved. Right. That'd be the worst thing imaginable. <laughs> but tricking him, eh, that might work. <laughs> you know, that might be the person fueling the conspiracy theory to be like, hey, you need to search this. This will get them to trouble that government. This is what happened. You know, their CIA news form of tactics sent Trump at them. <laughs> All right, let's jump into the notes. Okay, I'm sorry. It's not your fault. You did nothing wrong. You have nothing to apologize for. Oh, cool. It's all me. <laughs> you made you made a very good point. I had nothing to add. I looked at you and you were like, "Did I fuck this up?" You're like, <laughs> "No, I just didn't have anything to add." Um, it's like I go off for 15 minutes and then Harry says two minutes of things and thinks he's done wrong. I know, right? <laughs> You're not in trouble. I did not roll this paper up and hit you with it. Um, so that kind of gives you the the overarching background of the players and what's happening. And so that's kind of where we're at. So let's get to the phone call on July 25th with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. Trump urged Zelensky to investigate one of the front runners to take him on in the 2020 election. In the U.S., it is illegal to ask foreign entities for help in winning an election. Okay. Now, the problem with Trump, and we saw this with like Comey, for instance, Trump's slippery. As these narcissistic people usually are, they're very slippery can't really nail you on anything. They're smart enough to know the rules, and that's how they're good at violating it. Uh, so um, a rough transcript of the call later revealed that Trump had urged Zelensky to investigate former Vice President Joe Biden and his son Hunter. Now, Trump and his supporters allege Biden abused his power as vice president to pressure Ukraine to back away from a criminal investigation that could implicate his son who sat on the board of directors at a Ukrainian energy company. Now, what was the name of it? Burisma. Uh, Sorry, Burisma. That's okay. <laughs> Trump and his allies have been suggesting that Biden, as Barack Obama's vice president, encouraged the firing of Ukraine's top prosecutor in 2015 because he had been investigating the energy company Biden worked for. Now, at the time, by working closely with four known entities while his father was vice president, Hunter Biden was criticized for leaving his father exposed to suggestions of, political, of conflict of interest. And Trump has pointed to a boast of Biden made in 2018 about how as vice president, he had threatened to withhold a billion dollars in aid from Ukraine unless the prosecutor was fired. Now, Biden, however, says the motivation for wanting the prosecutor removed was because he was failing to crack down on corruption. Biden was not acting alone, but rather as the focal point of a wider anti-corruption drive in Ukraine, backed by the U.S. government, European allies, and the IMF. Now, the big debate is whether the transcript of Trump's call demonstrated a quid pro quo, Latin meaning something for something. I do this and you get this. It would be highly inappropriate. I think any rational thinking person would say it would be inappropriate for a president of the United States to withhold aid to investigate their political rival in an upcoming election. I think if you don't think that that's a problem, then you probably should maybe readjust your moral compass but is that what Donald Trump did? Was it a pre quid pro quo? The problem with the phone call as your basis is that it's very slippery. And now as we start to hear things leaked by some of these other ambassadors and other people, they definitely felt that it was a quid pro quo, but we'll get to that. Um, so let's just at this point, um, because some of this transcript stuff was a little new, so we haven't dived too deep into it. Let's just focus on the phone call. Was it a quid pro quo? David French, a uh, former writer at National Review, uh, upcoming at the Dispatch by Jonah Goldberg and uh, Stephen Hayes. Uh, he will be moving over there to write. He's a conservative writer. So David French breaks down how the transcript clearly shows a quid pro quo. French writes, near the beginning of the call, President Trump signals his displeasure with Ukraine. He notes that while the United States has been very good to Ukraine, he wouldn't say that Ukraine has been reciprocal to the United States. There's nothing subtle about that statement. But that's not terribly out of the norm for Trump. Like, he wants something from you, so we've been very good to you. You've been very bad to me. Give me what I want. There's nothing subtle about this statement, though, French writes. It's plain that Trump wants something from Ukraine. 
To be clear, there is nothing inherently wrong with that. Nations strike deals all the time. It's the nature of the proposed deal that's potentially problematic, not whether the two leaders bargain. He goes on to write, in the next paragraph, Zelensky responds with the key ask. He wants more javelin missiles. And what is Trump's response? The next words out of his mouth are, I would like you to do us a favor through, though, because our country has been through a lot and Ukraine knows a lot about it. So, Mr. President, we want missiles. And Donald Trump says, well, I'd like you to do us a favor. Then in the following paragraph, Trump continues his ask. He says he is going to ask Rudy Giuliani, his personal attorney, to call Zelensky, which, let me pause here. Why have your personal attorney call? If you're Donald Trump, if you're the president of the United States, why have your personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, an inherently political figure, make the phone call? A person who is working in the security uh, private sector, if you will, why have him do it? And not your ambassador or official state well, channels. And we, and, and we have a treaty with frugality you. is right. Yeah, yes. We have a treaty with Ukraine where if we believe that some corruption has taken place and we want that to be investigated, there are channels to go through. Right. It is not have your personal lawyer go and talk. What I think it speaks to is that Donald Trump does not trust anyone in the United States government and wants his own cronies around him doing work for him. I can trust Rudy. I can't trust the State Department. That's why when you hear people talk about secondary channels and yep. things like that, this is what we're talking about where we have a line of communication that usually happens between one country to another. Yep. And he's bypassing that because yep. he's not either getting what he wants out of those channels or he doesn't trust those channels. Or he, yeah, it, it isn't recorded. Correct. Yeah. yeah. This is a good lesson for you. So when you become president, <laughs> you don't send Abdul everywhere for you. Right. You know. Use official channels, Michael. Use my personal attorney, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he asks uh, his personal attorney to call Zelensky, and he asks Zelensky to take the call. Then Trump says this. The other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, and a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. He continues, Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution. So if you could look into it, it sounds horrible to me. And what is Zelensky's response? He pledges that the new Ukrainian prosecutor will be 100% his person and that, quote, he or she will look into the situation. There may not have been an explicit quid pro quo. Now, Trump may not have expressly said the disbursement of the funds was conditioned on the launch of a Ukrainian investigation into the Bidens. But even if there was no explicit threat, there was still presidential pressure coming at a time when money was on the line and when Trump had personally delayed the funds. The call, and now what does that mean? The call occurred several days after Trump blocked $391 million in military aid to Ukraine. Remember, they were invaded by Russia, so, and Crimea was taken over. So they have uh, security concerns, and $391 million is important to them. Uh, critics argue that this was used as a bargaining chip to pressure the Ukrainian government, and Trump denies it. Now, the money had been authorized by Congress earlier in the year and under the Constitution. Congress has the sole power of the purse. A president can neither spend unauthorized funds nor decline to spend the funds that Congress has authorized. Trump not only paused the payments, but he gave no clear reason why, instructing administration officials to tell lawmakers that the delays were part of an interagency inter process, but to give them no additional information. The payments weren't made until mid-September. If Trump tried to use aid money allocated by Congress to pressure the Ukrainian government into investigating one of his major political rivals, that would be a blatant effort to use federal funds for purposes that were never authorized by Congress. One thing I want to point out, too, is that the aid was released after the whistleblower document got sent to the White House, right, and William Barr. So, yeah, uh -oh. coincidence. Uh oh, <laughs> coincidence. Who said there was nothing? That this was nothing, and not to send it to anybody else, right? In which case, somebody said, "Oh, we need to send this to somebody else," and we'll, it got sent. We'll, to we'll cover House. that. Um, so the legislative branch does not often give the executive power, uh, the the executive, the power to withhold foreign aid money until various conditions are met, such as assisting U.S. foreign policy goals. So. The legislative branch says, just give the money. 
don't put conditions on it. You don't have that power. There is a long-standing debate over how much discretion the Constitution allows Congress to delegate the president on such matters. But in this case, Congress never authorized the president to use the aid money as leverage to force a foreign government to try to dig up dirt on the president's own political opponents and their family members. Ilya Soman wrote in Reason, if it turns out that Trump did indeed try to use these funds as leverage to dig up dirt against a political opponent, that sort of unconstitutional diversion of federal funds for personal gain is exactly the kind of abuse of power that the founders believed impeachment should be used to curb. It is not merely a form of personal corruption, but a dangerous undermining of the constitutional separation of powers. There's obvious reason to avoid giving any one man or woman the power to use fed the federal treasury as a piggy bank for their own personal agendas. I think that's an incredibly good point. Mm -hmm. That if you're on the fence about this, if you're like, I don't know, I mean, presidents do this all the time. One man has the ability to use the federal purse for political personal gain. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. So, yes, presidents do. As I said earlier, presidents do, you know, like Obama say, uh, yeah, tell uh, Putin, Putin, I'll have uh, more flexibility after the election to do these things that we want to do. Presidents do that all the time. They wheel and deal all the time. But mm -hmm. this is this is for personal personal gain. Personal gain. So um, now, so Reinhold mentioned the whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. the 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 whistleblowers, you're hearing whistleblowers all over the place. It's just blown whistles all over the There's place. Seven now. Seven now. Um, it's like one one was the whistleblower, and then the others were like, "Me too. Hey, mm -hmm. I want to join." Uh, at the heart of this story is a complaint from an unknown whistleblower reported to be a CIA official. He's not really unknown. He is not unknown? Do you know who it is? Tell us who it is. Did it dish the dirt? <laughs> Come on, Dennis. I'm serious. Who, who, who are they reporting to say it is? I don't remember the person's name. Uh, it starts with a C. But he's Always starts with a C, doesn't yeah, it, Harry? It starts with a C. Sounds like a former Biden staffer. Wait, what did you just say? A CIA official who was a former Biden staffer? Mm -hmm. So here's the problem with this, okay? <laughs> uh, if it's not obvious. Uh, now, Donald Trump, his very first, you know, he really was like, the deep state's had to get me. The deep state has kind of proven him to be right at multiple points. Uh, when he says the CIA, the FBI, the security services, uh, the NSA, they're all trying to undermine my presidency. And then it doesn't really look great when the CIA official comes out and is at the, at the center of an impeachment investigation. Now, Donald Trump has been highly critical of the CIA and the security services, and they don't really like that. Uh, we just recently did a podcast where maybe they killed the president. So uh, if you go and listen to that Kennedy podcast, the whole point's not the conspiracy, which is why that's towards the end. It's really to get you to think about the power of the security state. Uh, and the development of the industrial military complex over a long period. But Robin's super interesting and gets you to think about it. And if I can get you with the, the, the carrot of the conspiracy theory, then I got you with the meat uh, of, of learning about the military industrial complex. But that being said, Donald Trump, his first act was to basically go to the CIA headquarters, and he stood in front of the wall where all the CIA agents had been uh, that have been action. killed in action. He's standing there and he, you know, ah, you're going to love the support I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the best support. It's, you're going to be begging me to stop giving you support. And then goes on and just kind of rambles on and says a bunch of inappropriate stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, it was just all downhill from there. And then he, you know, the page and struck texts and the McCabe stuff and the Bruce Orr's of the world, a lot of that and him feeling that the steel dossier and the security services that I'm using that instead of the term deep state, mm -hmm. um, that, that they have played a, an instrumental role in collecting information to bring his presidency down. I don't feel that that's a particularly crazy line of thinking. Do either of you? Not really. I mean, I think that, their mindset is we're trying to keep things on an even keel and this person is so off board with crazy theories and trying to do things that are actually harmful right. to this country. We're trying to protect the country uh, against 
you know, one person who could tear it apart. One, one specific right. example, Helsinki, for instance. Every one of these agencies all said Russia was the one that hacked into the DNC servers. He's standing next to Putin and says, I don't know, maybe they're lying. Maybe it was Russia, maybe it wasn't Russia. I don't know. Well, that just enraged them because you have a president of the United States who's actively undermining one of the agencies that he is head of. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I started out by saying the president's at war with his own government and right. has been at, from the very beginning. And that is alluring to the libertarian mind. And our conspiratorial nature and inherent dislike, distrust, and hatred of the CIA specifically yep. mm -hmm. makes us very skeptical when we hear a CIA agent is leaking information. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, so, reportedly, this person was shaking after he heard the call, which, no, you weren't. You're just, if well, you were shaking, you care way too much about Donald Trump and no, you're a nut. I agree yeah. they may not be shaking, but they did all go to legal counsel and get a written yeah. paper trail and say, this, this is going on. It's all CYA. Something. Yeah. So yeah. go ahead, Harry. Oh, I was, what I was going to say, and you know, get a good, but the, it just goes to show you when a libertarian becomes president, you know, everyone's like, which department are you really going to close first? Well, we should go after them. CIA would, yeah. It it's really does show you, you right that you're first. right. If I become president tomorrow, the security services need to go first so I can maintain my presidency. Right. Uh, what about the Department of Education? Uh, they could stay. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, it's, it's, I'm going to go with the ones that are going to do it. We'll, we'll dial it back. We'll say that they can only do this and limit them. Get rid of the Homeland Security and go back yeah. to, the, you know, Tear it down. Yeah, just bring that down. Sh yeah, shrink some stuff. Listen, secu stuff. security mm -hmm. apparatus within a government have never been a problem in any in any government across the world. Make but it a hangable fence for the CIA to operate at all on U.S. soil. You just I mean, look at look at Russia. How how well Hang Russia on. ran because they had the yeah. KGB running thing. I mean, the trains ran on time in Germany because yeah, the of the SS, security service. Yeah, yeah the SS. The problem is that the, the problem that Trump highlights, uh, which is why Trump becomes somewhat sympathetic to the libertarian mind, is that he highlights the little fiefdoms of power that develop that undermine the other little fiefdoms of power mm -hmm. and render ineffective any type of reform because I'm just the adult in the room. Right. Donald Trump is just doing things that seem crazy, and we just need to be the adult in the room. We can't leave Syria. So we'll just um, ignore that, and we'll do this, and then that'll placate the, this crazy president. And so you do see a lot of – I do have a lot of sympathy for the Trump-supporting argument of the deep state is after him because it's not even a conspiracy at this point. It literally is like Page and Strzok and McCabe saying, we got to do something. It's the CIA whistleblower. It's – it, it, the lovers. It's, it's the military basically saying, mm, yeah, sorry, we're going to kind of ignore your order to vacate Syria last year. And I, I would be a lot more on board with that if it weren't for the fact that Trump was doing all of this crazy stuff and proving their points I, I for it. them. I get mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Right. right. So somebody said something about it today where they said the whistleblowers is, is you know, a former Biden guy and Rick Brennan and, you know, he's all for Obama and all that. And that's why this came out. I'm like, that's great. I don't care if Hillary Clinton herself is the whistleblower. Right. If Trump did that stuff that's in the whistleblower document, which we found overwhelming evidence that he has at this point, yeah. mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Right. So, so I wanted to add that caveat because I'm not totally anti-Trump here. I'm not trying, right. This is not a liberal podcast. I well, mean, he, he really does have a point when he says the media and the security in the deep state are are just completely anti-Trump at this point. He's right. They mm -hmm. are. Well, we were defending him on this, you know, Harry, me, you all were defending Trump against the Russia collusion thing because there wasn't yeah. really any evidence that he had right. done that. Right. And then we find out, you know, and if, if Trump had just shut up, like, yeah. you know, the Pop Brothers, you know, shut the up. <laughs> right. If he had just shut up and let all that stuff go, this would have all been over. Nobody would have known about any of it. Yeah. Right. They would just look like fools. But now he obstructed justice with the Mueller thing. He's got there's so many things that are going on mm -hmm. that aren't even related to the Ukraine yeah. that if it was just the Mueller thing, or if it was just Ukraine, it'd be one thing, but then you've also got two emoluments lawsuits again, going against him. You've got his, uh, the, the concern that he has for years used dual books in order to defraud the government from tax funds. 
uh, there's all this stuff going on that we're finding out about. And the problem is that Donald Trump, his entire presidency, before he even took office, from the second he was elected, long before that, he's just big one walking. He's one big walking scandal. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a large segment of the population, and I'm not. I don't. I probably put myself in this camp somewhat. It, you start with a clean slate. We know you're a fundamentally corrupt person, but you start with a clean slate. Let's give you a fair chance. You could end up being the most moderate president in oh, history, yeah. and, you know. And he never was given that chance. And so when he when he farts, and it's the lead story on CNN, and he's it's a scandal. It's like you you are so worn out by the people who are crying wolf all the time that when wolf a wolf finally enters the house, you go. Yeah, but you've been crying wolf literally every single day for five years. Right. But also, Trump never, it, from the beginning, never shown any sense of reasonability to latch onto and give him that. Right. I, so from I, day I, one, I, I don't. I think you may have felt that way, but I think it is for a lot of people. He, it, a lot of people through the campaign and when he became presidency, it was kind of like. We don't know what is the media and the the hysterics of uh, Trumpian presidency, and what is Donald Trump's actual insanity. But that's the thing is that he was he was doing public speaking. He was Twitter tweeting. We know what he was saying. He was saying things. We're going to go after the families of terrorists. We're going to block all these people coming into the United. He was he was saying so many unreasonable things, and has tried implementing them. I mean. We, we kill more civilians in Afghanistan now than the Taliban does because of the amount of bombs we're dropping on them from this right. president. There's so many things. It's just, I, I think a lot of people just get overwhelmed with all of it and they start looking for, this can't be real. Right. Um, breaking news. Uh, Kentucky Democrat Bashar is apparent winner over GOP Governor Matt Bevin in Blow to Trump, NBC projects. Even the headline is about Trump. <laughs> right like that's the, well but that's how they sell views you I get clicked it. on it because they said that uh, it's no, i'm i'm more right. interested in the fact that a democrat by less than one percent beat matt bevan mm, sure. a tea party republican who mm -hmm. in kentucky so you've got mitch mm -hmm. mcconnell up for election you've oh. got a deeply red state and i uh, want mitch to go down so bad now <laughs> They make it all it's about not gonna happen, but Trump campaigning in there, but the, what you also have to remember is that Matt Bevin's kind of a, a divisive figure down there, I believe. Yeah. So the problem, the problem with McConnell down there in Kentucky too is that he's made his power base in Washington from the fact that he can raise money better than anybody. Yeah. So all these different senators go to him to have him raise their money for him, so they owe him, and that's why he's mm -hmm. in charge of all this stuff. Oh, hogs at one re-election, by the way. Uh, obviously. Oh, uh, <laughs> just uh... wow, seventy percent. Okay, all right. Local politics. Really? I wow, seventy percent electorate. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that, that, can't, that has to be early voting. I mean, early well, results. That's not ninety-nine percent. No, that's uh, sixty-five thousand total votes, and the Democratic mayor here in Marion County won by uh, he won with seventy percent of the vote, which is crazy, crazy. Get uh, in uh, the blue. More line. potholes. Yeah. More potholes. <laughs> yeah. um, Hummer so sales. Red right line. Line. I totally forgot to vote. I'm sorry to Libertarian <laughs> candidate Douglas McNaughton. Who worked Douglas his, McNaughton. Douglas, he worked his I butt off. I could have been the vote that put him over the top. but I, I don't live in Hindu. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was like... <laughs> So it's like, well, what did you do that I didn't know about? I was scared, like, well, well, what did I just do? <laughs> All right. So let's let's get back to uh, the whistleblowers. So, um, so this CIA official, he is, uh, he, he writes this report and he goes to, he doesn't take it to Congress. He takes it to a Justice Department official. And the Justice Department official said basically, yeah, this is no big deal. Uh, and then it got leaked somehow, and then it was like, oh, there's some well, so some juicy stuff. So I here. went to the appropriate person, and that person, in normal circumstances for any kind of whistleblower document, would go to the Department of Justice, which was William Barr, and say, what do we do about this, right? Right. But when William Barr and the president are implicated in that, he probably should not have done that. Now, they came back to him and said, uh, ignore it. It's no big deal. It's, it doesn't rise to the level of immediate concern 
which was one of the legal terms that we have to use um, for this in order to pass it on to Congress. Now, it's supposed to go to the head of the intelligence committees in the Congress and in the Senate, in the House and the Senate. Um, so they were blocking that from happening. They were telling them just to shelve it. And then it got, it, it got to the committee heads anyway. I don't know if the, the person in, in question actually went ahead and did that or if it got leaked by the whistleblower, but somehow it got to them that this was going on. And in the meantime, that's when the, the aides started, you know, w they had some Republican senators find out about that, call the president, the aide got released. Right. Because if they had waited another couple of weeks mm -hmm. to the end of September, that aid would have been blocked, blocked. Right. So, so in fiscal year stuff. In yeah. August, the first anonymous intelligence official wrote a letter expressing concern over Trump's July phone call with the Ukrainian president. They said they had an urgent concern, a month later, that Trump had used his office to, quote, solicit interference from a foreign country in the 2020 presidential election. They alleged that the White House acted to, quote, lock down all details of the phone call between Trump and Zelensky and that the call transcript was not stored in the usual computer system. And um, we know more about that now, too. There is also, uh, you know, the the acting chief of staff kind of let slip that there may be tape of it, too, in his press conference, his failed press conference. According to the whistleblower's report, White House officials were directed by the White House lawyers to remove the electronic transcript from the computer system in which such transcripts are typically stored for sharing and other use within the administration. Instead, the records were to be stored in a more secretive and compartmentalized system designed for classified information. One White House official, the report says, described this as a, quote, abuse of the more secretive system because the Ukraine call records did not belong there. In their letter, the whistleblower admitted that they had not directly witnessed the call, but said accounts shared by other officials had painted a consistent picture, which is part of the con criticism of this initially, was that this guy wasn't involved in it. It's like, well, now we have had a lot of confirmation from a lot of different people, but you know, early on, it was like, this guy wasn't even on the call. He didn't hear it, so. Mm -hmm. Well, now remember, the attorney, the, um, the IG, um, the investigator who's responsible for this, who this report goes to, he had to spend a week and and uh, kind of do his own little investigation on this to find out if it's credible or not. So imagine that he talked to the person, talked to the people who were on the call, got some information from them, found out it was credible, and that's how it got passed right. on. So it wasn't like this came, this document came in, and that's where it went. I mean, there was some invest initial investigation done before it was even passed on to the, um, the White House at some point. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about congressional investigations, um, just briefly, uh, because we're going to do another show on this particular part uh, because it's a complicated process. We've already done the history of impeachment in episode 333. You can see that in the show notes. Uh, now, the Constitution doesn't say a lot about impeachment. As we said, it says the House shall have the sole power of impeachment and the Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. So think of the House as the grand jury hearing the weight of the evidence to decide if there is an indictment on the person or not. They impeach the president, then they go to the Senate, and that's where the trial. We're going to uh, decide if these charges are fit and remove the president or not. Um, theoretically, he would get impeached because if it, it would pass on party lines. Uh, the Senate, the um, some Republican group sent a bunch of moving boxes to 20 vulnerable House Democrats uh, to try and scare them. But uh, as Nancy Pelosi was initially against, I thought that was a baller move. I don't know about you, but um, <laughs> it's, it's funny. But the reality is that uh, six months ago, with Russia, you know, Nancy Pelosi was not there on impeachment because you saw an absolute bloodbath in um, uh, the 1998 and 2000 elections for Republicans because they were perceived as prosecuting for their own political game, a popular president, and the Re House Republicans lost big, and Democrats came in a wave uh, because of that failed impeachment, and so Republicans are trying to intimidate Democrats into uh, defecting. Um, but what Nancy Pelosi and several reporters and, and others have said is that a lot of those swing state, the swing district Democrats now 
uh, because of the shifting poles, feel a lot more comfortable. They feel this is much more uh, an actual impeachable in uh, a thing. Mm -hmm. And so they're not as intimidated by this. So party lines, he'd get impeached, but he wouldn't be removed. Now, no particular process is specified or required. The House determines the procedures it will use to, in effect, issue an indictment to the president, and the Senate then conducts a trial. Now, the House can follow whatever rules at once. Congress is engaged in an investigation, not a trial. If the president is impeached or indicted, then he would have the right to present evidence and cross-examine witnesses mm -hmm. as part of his trial in the Senate. And Congress has the authority to subpoena anyone in the private sphere or the administration for a legislative purpose. So, as announced in Wilkinson v. the United States, a congressional committee must meet three requirements for its subpoenas to be legally sufficient. First, the committee's investigation of the broad subject area must be authorized by its chamber. Second, the investigation must pursue a, quote, valid legislative purpose, but does not need to be involved, does not need to involve legislation, and does not need to specify the ultimate intent of Congress. And three, the specific inquiries must be pertinent to the subject matter area that has been authorized for investigation. Now, Congress can go to a federal court to ask a judge to enforce a subpoena that is being ignored, but that move takes time. And in the end, the House may just simply decide to use the White House refusal as another justification for impeachment. And what's happening is like Rick Perry, for instance, refused to go and uh, honor his subpoena by the House. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are several committees investigating this at this time, and many White House officials across the board are refusing to go in and, and ha be deposed, basically. So this is all kind of private depositions where House members are doing this stuff in secret. They're, mm -hmm. It's not, it, it's, I believe, on the record, but it's just not in plain public view. It's not a shit dog and pony show. They're actually having a private deposition with con congressional members. They're just not doing it for the cameras, which I am all for because yeah. we don't need any more Spartacus bull crap. Right. I mean, the transcripts are being released. It's not right. like they're and, and even, even with the transcripts being released and you read those transcripts, you can still see the grandstanding from the Republicans on there. It's yes. I, it's I'm all for horrible. transparency, but the fact is, is I also want the truth and you have a better shot of getting the truth. If it's a private deposition, with that information to be released later than uh, a dog and pony show like the Kavanaugh hearings. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, so where everybody's trying well, and, to. Hard. And they've made it so they, they have actually put together the rules that are going to take place when they move to the next phase of this. Um, and one of the things they've decided to do is instead of having those five minutes uh, back and forths, mm -hmm. they're doing 90 minutes. Um, I think 45 minutes each side. Basically, they're. Democrats go for 45 minutes and the Republicans for 45 minutes. And then they can actually have a lawyer doing the questioning for them. Right. An actual attorney. So through this stuff, we've gotten some interesting stuff coming from Ambassador Taylor and then also the ambassador to the EU, the Son Sondland. Sondland guy, uh, who just strikes me as the type of guy who's trying to set himself up for a run for office. What what are some of the things, because the, the ambassador, like that was the, quote, smoking gun, but the Ambassador Taylor testimony was leaked. And what are some, what are we kind of learning from some of that stuff? Some of the things we're learning is that uh, between Taylor and uh, the the one person who was on the call, who's the uh, Purple Heart recipient, the uh, uh, Vinland, mm -hmm. um, was that there was a concerted effort that the to have Ukraine that not just the phone call, the meeting with uh, Donald Trump being contingent on them making an announcement of investigating Biden, but also um, the aid was also contingent upon that as well. Right. Uh, so this all came out, and then Sondland gave his testimony first, right? So Sondland gave his testimony, and he says that the Trump Trump told me there was a, a no quid pro quo. I had no reason not to believe him. I didn't know who Burisma was. Uh, I just thought it was a company. So I just thought it was about corruption. I don't know anything about all this stuff, yeah. right? Then Taylor and Vinland, um, they do their uh, statements and, and dep depositions. And we find out from the leaked information there and now released publicly um, that he did know and he was orchestrating all of this. Right. 
now apparently today Sondland I get it, it the the letter was dated yesterday Sondland has released a new statement four page statement saying um okay so I did know that this stuff was a quid pro quo and and that was going on so he's trying to he's trying to keep himself from being the fall guy because they they were setting him up to be the guy who would you know Sondland was doing all this stuff without my knowledge I didn't know anything about it so he's now basically flipped and said hey this was going on as well yeah, so kurt, now if you're thinking kurt volker trump's former special representative for ukraine negotiations um volker me are you not no i was thinking of vinland okay all right he's he's the nsc oh you're right yeah. you're right okay so let me read this from the new york times this was released uh just a few hours before we sat down 8 10 p.m actually updated while we were doing the show uh it is from the New York Times. Sondland updates impeachment testimony describing Ukrainian quid pro quo. A crucial witness in the impeachment inquiry reversed himself this week and acknowledged to investigators that he had told a top Ukrainian official that the country would most likely have to give President Trump what he wanted, a public pledge for investigations, in order to unlock military aid. The disclosure from Gordon Sondland, an ally of Mr. Trump, who is the United States ambassador to the European Union, confirmed his role in laying out a quid pro quo to Ukraine that conditioned the release of security assistance from the U.S. That admission, included in a four-page sworn statement released on Tuesday, directly contradicted his testimony to investigators last month, where he said he never thought there was any precondition on the aid. I said the resumption of U.S. aid would likely not occur until Ukraine provided the public anti-corruption statement that we had been discussing for many weeks. Um, so Mr. Sondland's disclosure appeared intended to insulate himself from accusations. So uh, the he's a wealthy Oregon hotelier who donated to the president's campaign. Um, yeah, so you're starting to see uh, Mr. Volker's transcript, one of the three amigos that I mentioned earlier shows that via text he sent a Ukrainian official the script that the White House wanted President Zelensky to read, including announcing an investigation into Burisma and a conspiracy theory about the election, as you mentioned earlier. So, yeah. Uh, these three amigos, Rick Perry, uh, Volker, Kurt Volker, and um, Sondland, are kind of at the heart of things as, long, as well as Ambassador Taylor and the other former ambassador, uh, what's her name? Yanovich. Yanovich, sorry, I didn't have that stuff written down. I should have, because I forget this stuff. I'm keeping a lot of information well, in my head here. And we're talking a lot of Ukrainian names, which yeah. just for some reason are hard to keep yes. in your head. So, so uh, yeah, that is uh, the, that that that's kind of like the the starter's guide to the Ukraine stuff here. So, um, well, there's another story that just came out too. Okay. So, do you remember? the two guys who were arrested um, on their way to Vienna on one-way tickets who had just had lunch with Rudy Giuliani, mm -hmm. who Giuliani was on his way to Vienna as well the next day. Uh, they were arrested for campaign finance laws, you know, breaking some campaign finance laws. One of them, Parnes, has announced today that he is willing to speak to the um, inquiry the impeachment inquiry uh, and give all pertinent information and documentation as long as he doesn't um, have to answer anything that would, that would, you know, incriminate himself. Right. So fifth amendment stuff there, but he's willing to give all information he can. Right. And apparently it's come from the fact that Trump said, I don't know this guy. I don't know who he is. And that ir that made him mad. Yep. Cause same, he has spent same, a lot of time. Same thing with Michael Cohn. It's like, yeah. why does Trump do that? Yeah. And, and, and the interesting thing, too, that I found remember out. Remember when we were going to impeach him over election laws that Michael Cohen was going to – it's just the one big long impeachment. The, but the problem with the Michael Cohen thing was that he flipped on he flipped on Trump after he had already lied. So his credibility was shot. Right. Right. But, you know, that's just a long line of things. So, But the other thing that I found out um, was that Parnas' function – uh, was he was actually working for some Ukrainian um, people uh, trying to get the ambassador to Ukraine from the United States fired. So 
Ukrainian people hired this guy to go to Washington to try to get Yanovich fired, mm. which ended up happening. So, yeah, that doesn't look good. So here we are. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, final thoughts. Is Trump screwed or any other things that you'd like to add, Harry? I think we're all screwed, personally. Yeah. Um, it's uh, just... It's an interesting situation watching getting played out because if there's... It's it's almost like waiting for an event that has been hyped up for the last two, two mm-hmm. and a half years that's now like, okay, all right, now it's probably actually going to happen. Yeah. It's, we just got to sit back and watch and wait. Uh, the... I'm almost wanting him to be impeached to be elected again. I think it'd be funny. (laughs) (laughs) What's the maximum amount of chaos we can squeeze out of this? Exactly. You know, right. Uh, How will, how spicy will the memes be? Um, And then I realized, and also, uh, yeah, fixed the database sheets and uh, watched it, watched how big it was actually. Um, I'm still still calculating on my phone trying to tell me how big it is. That's what Harry's been doing all this time. The other thing is I realized... He stopped listening to his own show. He's just calculating databases yeah. instead. It's what he tunes out when I talk. Yeah, it's way more fun than yeah. this. I also <laughs> somehow must have programmed it wrong for Spangles tweets to go to the database. Apparently, it wasn't going into a database. It has ju- jumped into a text file. So I, I, I keep all your tweets, too. Okay, good. Uh, but it went into a text file. So it's a huge text. Just text. Send that text. to me, actually, because I, I tried to delete all my tweets, and uh, I can't get to most of them. So. Oh, you want to know, just so you can know which I just ones you need see to tweet? What, what, when did I say the career ender? <laughs> <laughs> Was uh, this going to come bite me in the butt? Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll, I'll send this to you. Uh, the, yeah, the other thing I also uh, want to talk about is, like, uh, to the people who, like, uh, Yes, I'm still on the Discord channel. I hang out on Discord, and I still jump in the chat room for all the new people who are new to the podcast. Yes, we do hang out in the Discord. You can find that at wearelibertarians.com. We got a link there. Yeah, I, uh, new listener um, to the show, a few months, uh, just a few months listener, jumped into the Discord and hung out with me on Saturday night. I think I sent him your way. He's like, how do I get in there? I was like, I am too dumb to tell you how to get into the Discord. It's on the website. Yeah, and he sat there. It was kind of cool because I was sitting in the chat room. I was like, man, your voice sounds familiar. Who are you? <laughs> and I had a great time hanging out with him. Great guy. Cool. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, uh, Epstein didn't kill himself. And uh... <laughs> It's hilarious. <laughs> Did you see the, uh, the, the guy who was on Fox News on Waters World, and he was like, going through it and the other thing about these dogs is that you don't want to do this and then jeffrey epstein didn't kill himself <laughs> yeah it's great. It's so good. <laughs> second best thing after nfl cat this week mm-hmm. see mm-hmm. nfl cat run out of the field no nfl cat oh you gotta go look up the cat that ran onto monday night football monday night football this cat just starts black cat just starts running onto the dallas cowboys field then the the announcer starts doing play-by-play and the cat's at 10. He's at the 5. Oh, touchdown, Black Kitty. <laughs> and then he runs up in the stands, and the people are terrified. It's great. Touchdown, the Cowboys are getting. Uh, yeah. yeah, the only time the, the cat's been in the end zone more times than the Falcons this year. Oh. Thank you. That's I cool. wrote that myself. Yeah, that's good. But is, right, are, you, is, are you working on that bit? Is that the bit you're so working that's on? That's my bit, yeah. Okay. Ooh, my He's going to sell it to Costi. Costaki, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Costaki, kind of yeah. Uh, anything else? Uh, yeah, no, no. that's it. Okay, Reinhold. Uh, if you're asking me if Trump is screwed, no, he's he's going to get impeached. I mean, there's there's no two ways about that. I think his presidency did. I think people are starting to wake up and smell the coffee. That it's not just a, um, it, it's not just a plot to get him. He's actually legitimately a bully. Yeah. Uh, and a little crazy and a little band child and doesn't really know how to speak very well in my opinion yeah. but beyond that, and, and I'm I always worry about how I speak and, and I come across when I do these podcasts and I'm talking and yeah. and I realize if, if you if, if the president can be this inarticulate yeah. then I don't care I wouldn't invite you back if you were horrible <laughs> but uh, I don't know anything it really depends on what we find out because I this isn't over Right. Right. I mean, we're in the middle of this, and we're finding things out new. It, it, just when you think you've got to the end of it, some new crazy thing happens the next week, and you're like, so 
at, at some point, I think if public opinion sways far enough, the Senate, the senators, Republican senators may be going, I need to save the party. I need to save my the own country. Butt. Yeah. yeah. Uh, even if they're not looking out for the party, but or for the country, but looking out for their own party, because this could ruin the GOP. I mean, tear it down pretty hard. I mean, it, you look uh, at what Nixon, the they, Nixon Act. It, right. After, I mean, the country didn't really survive yeah, Vietnam still, and you know, Nixon yeah. and Watergate. I mean, and it the, took a while. Yeah. So, so that that brings us to the point of, do they determine that it's better to have Pence in for a year and let him run for office instead? Yeah. Uh, so, so I think that there's going to be some discussions and concerns in the Senate if more things come out and opinion starts to swing even further. Now, if we start seeing 55, 56, 57 percent support for impeach for removal, because we're at the 49, 50 percent right now. Yeah, you know, we got a majority, and that never happened with Clinton. Clinton was always like in the 30s. Right. Uh, so that's why the backlash to Clinton was so much. I don't think the backlash to Trump is going to be anywhere near that because th the number of people who already right now are saying they want him removed from office is the majority of the people in the country. Right. So it, if that gets worse, that could spell some doom. But there's a lot of people in the Senate who are just all in. Yeah. And I don't know if they can be broken out of it. I don't. I don't know if they're all in or they're maybe true believers, but a lot of them like Rand Paul are just opportunists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think it remains to be seen on whether or not he gets removed. I don't, if I were a betting man, I would say probably not, yeah. but I, I still think this really damages him. I don't, I don't see, I, and I've said this before, I don't see a way for him to get reelected, but again, I don't know. Things change. Is this, we're, we're a year out from the election, right? Yeah. Today. Mm -hmm. So, who knows what could happen? My final thought is basically that I think Donald Trump is going to get impeached. I think this is just beyond the pale. Like there, there's, there are some things where it's like, yeah, I could see how that's just leftist propaganda and the media participating in it. And I get it. And like, that's how I felt about Russia for a long time. Mm -hmm. But this is the guy clearly as the evidence seems to mount up over these weeks like, this is clearly a quid pro quo. This is clearly a person using federal funds in a way they're not supposed to be used constitutionally for his own personal gain on multiple levels, trying to get reelected. It's just the kind of behavior that when you read back, and, and, and I'm reading The Final Days by Bob Woodward and Bernstein, like, you're just like, the similarities are striking. This is just a person who is has just lost the benefit of the doubt with me in all areas. I mean, I was never a big Trump fan after he got elected. I was like, I'm going to give the guy a chance. Where'd that get me? A lot of laughs. I think he's the funniest guy in the world. Mm -hmm. Like, but it's just not funny anymore. It's now sad. You know, it's like your, your buddy that you go out drinking with, he's a, such a good time. And then eventually he drinks every day and it gets sad. So I just think we're kind of at that point. So I, I think he's, I think he's just kind of uh, – I think he's in trouble. I think he's uh, – the only way he gets reelected is that any one of these Democrats is the nominee. <laughs> so that's what's the crazy thing. It's such a race to the bottom. There's 0.0, .0 Libertarian Party candidates that I will vote for next year. Uh, if Justin Amash gets in, I'll vote for him. But right now, I'm, I'm – no, I'm not voting for Tulsi. She's an economic nightmare. Yang. Come no. on, come on. Yeah, but as we see, Race to the bottom. They, they don't really, that's all Congress stuff. I mean, the president really doesn't do a lot of yeah. economics. He, yeah. So. Gang, gang. All right. Thanks for joining us here on this episode of We Are Libertarians. It's uh, always nice to talk to all of you, and we thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next week.